We are so gratified as a team to be able to strengthen our connections and collective voice through these platforms, through our platform that we've been evolving for the last 38 years now. My name is Laurel Reddington. I'm the Community Outreach Director here and a DJ. And I wanna thank you for spending time with us and helping us, what we say every week here is this, these are conversations that are meant to be uncomfortable. It's not a comfortable situation that uh, to have these conversations and that's okay and that's expected. So what we're really driving at when we have these conversations is for us to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. Tonight, we are gonna have our broad topic is generational perspectives of, of racism and language used, meaning you know, what proper terms are used today? What are people comfortable with? Uh, what, is, what are people uncomfortable with? Uh, the subtopic is fear on, on both sides, but with a focus on white fear. And we're gonna talk about that in just a second. But I wanna thank AHA New Bedford for helping to make these panels happen for your underwriting support. And we have a bunch of geniuses on the panelists. So I want to uh, introduce them because they are so full of grace and humility. Uh, so allow me to introduce them one more time in, in short form, but they have each have bios on our diversity page as well as links to their various publications that they have out and the work that they do. So I'll begin with Clennon King, Clennon L. King. He comes from Albany, Georgia, but spent many years in Boston as a journalist, winning many awards, including an Emmy nomination from the National Academy of Television, Arts and Sciences, Suncoast chapter, a regional and national Edward R. Murrow, and a National Association of Black Journalists News Award. He's been reporting on race for his entire career and lesser known stories. He's also been recognized by Columbia University's Graduate School of Journal Journalism. His family was in the foreground of the civil rights movement. And while he is not related to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., there is a family-like connection between their families because Clennon's father, C.B. King, was an attorney who represented civil rights demonstrators, including Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in 61 and 62 during his time working with the movement there. Sandy Pimentel, uh, well, Clennon, do you wanna give a wave so people see you? And um, we have Sandy Pimentel is the co-founder of the Martha's Vineyard Diversity Coalition. She graduated from UMass Boston with a degree in management of human services and has spent her entire lifetime working on local and national levels, helping to improve the quality of life for kids, teens, and everybody really, adults. Social change is her calling. And she's also the author of Blind Acceptance, which speaks of her metamorphosis as she confronts the realities of war, racism, and other cultural changes for women of her time. So Sandra, Sandy, thank you for being here tonight. Pete Ambrositis, he's a senior client partner for Corn Ferry and has more than 30 years of business and consulting experience, specializing in the development of and, and really importance of diversity strategies. And he's been mined for information and interviews with the Wall Street Journal and training and development magazine. And, and he was in the book Motivation by Paul Levesque. Now, you, yes, if you're a wrestling fan, it is Triple H, the talented wrestler turned executive vice president of global talent strategy and development for the WWE. And Pete's heart is just rooted in being an example of how to move through the world and guides others to reach their best selves too. So thank you, Peter, for being here. Tiffany Adams, what a 25 year old soul, full, full of radiance and she, she's just charged with action. She's a youth activist who teaches anti-racist workshops. She's active on all fronts and ready to engage proactively at any moment to help create opportunities for us to make life equitable for all of us, to draw attention to the things we do that perpetuate systemic racism and uh, reveal what we can do instead to be part of the, the wave that will wash away mindsets that we have. And, uh, hold us back and, and cause unnecessary pain and tragedy. She does her work with a nonprofit calling all crows and as a co-founder of the Glitty Gang Collective, uh, elevating black communities through faith, activism, entertainment and service. I want to uh, congratulate them and you on you becoming an LLC. So Glitty Gang Collective has officially just become a, uh, an LLC and they have their first fundraiser starting today going through March 1st. So it's official. Congratulations on all the work that you're doing for, for the world, Tiffany. Michael McAuliffe. Okay, so Michael has been practicing law for over 30 years. He's still doing that. Some of the highlights, because you know a lot of these bios are just too long. You can't tell everything that, that they're doing. But in 2008, Mr. McAuliffe was elected by the voters in Palm Beach County to serve as a state attorney in and for the 15th Judicial Court uh, Circuit, uh, Palm Beach County. 
He started his career in the late 80s, early 90s as a federal civil rights prosecutor in the criminal section of the Civil Rights Division at the Department of Justice in Washington, D.C. And during this time, he investigated and prosecuted cases from hate crimes, law enforcement misconduct, and involuntary servitude and human trafficking cases, handling numerous cases uh, that were on a national level, including the successful prosecution of the Grand Dragon of the Louisiana Ku Klux Klan and 13 of his associates for hate crimes, an experience he turned into his recently released debut crime novel, No Truth Left to Tell, which is an expertly told thriller. You can find out more about that at mvyradio.org slash diversity under his bio. And Dr. Walter Collier, he is one of the founders of the trustee of the Martha's Vineyard Diversity Coalition and a trustee emeritus, an organization dedicated to eradicating racism here on this island and beyond. He was a consultant for the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, National Science Foundation, U.S. Department of Defense, New York State Division of Parole, International Episcopal Church Center, Princeton University, and the list goes on and on. He is sought after, and he's also written numerous research articles and other publications on a wide range of topics, including racism and diversity in the U.S. STEM workforce. And his most recent book from 2016 is called why racism persists and uncomfortable truth. And I wanna thank him for inspiring these panel discussions and, and uh, helping us move these along. Dr. Collier, thank you so much for your heart and soul and being here. So our, our, our broad topic, uh, generational perspectives, we've got a lot of ground to cover this hour. And we're gonna start off with defining what fear is. A lot of people want to know what, you know, what this, what white fear is and white uh, fragility and helping us uh, be more comfortable being uncomfortable. Again, I, it's just really important for us to repeat that. This, these are not comfortable and it's not meant to be comfortable, but as Shannon from Ohio said that, uh, you know, discomfort I have come to see is not a bad thing. Rather being uncomfortable is a healthy sign that we are growing, learning and evolving and it's really important. So thank you, Shannon, for echoing that and supporting the heart of these panels is being uncomfortable, which is what we've been saying from day one. So Michael, let's start with you and have you talk to us about that white fear. Well, I, I, I maybe one easy example to introduce the larger topic of white fear is the Black Lives Matter movement and, um, and some of the reaction to even the label Black Lives Matter. Uh, we were talking about this for a moment before the, the formal discussion started. And uh, you know, it's, it's, if I can offer any insight, it, was, it would be only as an individual in what I've observed, but, but, but here's how I perceive the issue in terms of some of the um, initial and maybe ongoing uh, pushback against uh, uh, even the name of, of the movement, uh, Black Lives Matter, and it's a misperception, I think, on uh, on a lot on a number, a significant number of white people's behalf as to what that label actually means. They view it as a zero sum proposition. So, if a Black Live Life matters more. Or, or you know, they they hear it as more than my matter, my life uh, as a white person must matter less. Or it's a me too. Hey, all lives matter, um, and so why are you just talking about black lives? And and so I, what I think uh, maybe folks miss about the the even the label of the movement is that it's black lives that have been undervalued and been. Um, discriminated against and uh, and the headwinds and the walls that we've talked about last uh, a week that still persist uh, across every facet of life in the United States. So the movement is saying that that a black li life matters. It's a it's a singular proposition uh, that either has a yes or a no uh, buy-in to it, and it doesn't have to be relational in the sense that, uh, that there's not a limited sum of value to place on a life or a race or, um, or a people. So by saying Black Lives Matter, it's not diminishing any other life on earth. It's just bringing that to the forefront. Uh, Peter, you were saying some things. I was, thanks Laurel, and it's, it's Pete, remember? So the, the, the 
truth of the matter is when we're talking about this whole instance of white fear and whether it's the fear at zero sum uh, comment that Michael made is, is certainly true when someone is in a majority and they are seeing the population shifts that are happening and there's not going to be a way to stop that population shift from happening. You go from the, being in the majority to potentially being not in the majority. There's a, some fear in, incorporated into that. More importantly, I think from based on the people that I talk to every day, there's also this thing, there's a, a, there's a balance between actually the fear is about being embarrassed that they don't know more about what we mean when we talk about white privilege or talk about the fact that when you're being raised in, in, in a black culture, you're not even sure about what language to use. So there's a, some an ignorance issue, there's some uh, embarrassment issue. And again, if we go back to what we talked about on the first week of the series, being curious and being courageous is a combination pack that can get us in a long way in these discussions because none of us have all the answers, not, not diversity and inclusion practitioners, not folks that have been raised in a, in a totally white environment as a baby boomer. I gotta tell you, I did not have a whole lot of diverse friends growing up. I was in a very, uh, in an industry that was very male dominated. So to get where I've gotten over time as a 60 year old guy has taken some progress and I've made some mistakes and being willing to be out there and, and ask questions that may show that I'm not as smart as I might pretend to be is an issue. So it, it, it kind of also just goes into natural human nature of not wanting to look ignorant or stupid. But um, I think, uh, so what about some other, um, Sandy, you were talking about, when we were talking about white, about fear and where this fear comes from, um, it, it gets, comes from a very irrational place and a very, I, I think, again, it goes back to education um, on what we, how we uh, understand things and things from the past. And this is going into generational perspectives too, where it's much different nowadays than it was from, you, you know, when you, you're, what you're talking about, Sandy, how you grew up. Can you talk about how you've evolved your thinking on um, this fear that people have? Oh, you're, um, you're muted. Sorry, sorry about that. Okay. Um, yeah, I think uh, um, in thinking about this, I think um, a lot of it depends on how, how we've been socialized. And I think um, uh, fear is, is really kind of generated inside of us by what we see and the messages we get over time. And I think it's, a, it, it's personal to each of us to look at those fears and see how we can uh, rewire ourselves really because it's there um, and it's been, it isn't accidental. It's been sort of groomed in all of us in many of us who are white. So is that what you mean, Laurel? Yeah, yeah, I think that, you know, one of the things that when, when um, Dr. Collier and I were talking was, where does this fear come from? And I think that, you know, it's something that we need to address or at least admit to ourselves because there's a lot of these things that come up and if we don't draw attention to that, uh, that fear or that, that little stumbling block, we can get stuck there uh, and with it just hanging over our heads, not knowing that, it's real. So I think if we say them out loud and we get these different perspectives on what that fear is and just say it out loud, um, then we can free ourselves up to go out in public and say, okay, it's okay that I don't know what I'm talking about. I want to know, let me ask the question. Um, so turning over to, you know, other perspectives and um, the other side of white fear, Dr. Collier, what would you say, you know, from, since, you know, you were talking about this um, from your perspective, uh, you're on, um, you're muted too. Sorry. So while, Walter, why don't we go to Tiffany while you're working on um, getting your, get, coming off of mute. And Tiffany, why don't you, um, you share your thoughts because you had some good ones on this too. I definitely think that like white people do not try to engage in certain things because of fear. And it's the fear of open conflict. It's the fear of 
like not being perfect. Like I think sometimes we live in a society where when we are not perfect, um, it's problematic. Like people have a problem with being wrong, which is a problem, right? And in the white supremacy teaching that I do, it's actually a white supremacist characteristic um, of both of those actually perfectionism, which is like not being, not doing any fail, not failing at all. Like not, that's perfectionism. And then the fear of open conflicts, not engaging in these conversations because you're afraid that it's gonna be like, conflict. And I think that before like we're able to really dissect what fear is, we need to go back to the principles and look at what white supremacy is. Look at what those characteristics are and see how we perpet perpetuate those characteristics. So do we want to talk about what that is, um, Walter? Do you yeah. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Perfect. Oh. Thank you. Uh, I want to dovetail on what Tiffany just said. Um, uh, Laurel, you mentioned before that the fear is irrational. Uh, not com completely. Uh, whites, uh, through the, the concept of white supremacy, have been brought up to let them know that they should always be first in line. And when they are confronted with a new reality that they are not first in line, they are not eligible to be first in line, then that brings about cognitive dissonance. They are not sure what to do. And in that, that fear of, of, of a sphere, rather, of, a, of uncertainty rises fear because they don't know how to respond. And they, and they begin to think perhaps they have been duped or miseducated. And uh, with all of that uncertainty, uh, fear rises up. So it, I don't think it's completely irrational. It's probably a, a, a natural response uh, to, uh, to the way uh, that they have been brought up, uh, as uh, Sandy has pointed out. Um, but I think, um, as we are talking, fear needs to be dealt with, because psychology teaches us that people will only change with the right kind of incentive and motivation. And unless we can, uh, unless we decide to honestly address the fear, the anxiety around this change, uh, that is inevitable, uh, we're never going to get anywhere. I mean, we will have nice conversations as, as we're doing now, and people will learn from the conversations, but action, action is something that will probably be delayed because we're not really dealing with how do we motivate people to change who had not been asked to change before, who had not been asked to to uh, look at themselves differently and, and to look at other people differently. Um, so that, that fear, that uncomfortableness, that anxiety uh, really must be addressed. Yes, without question, agreed. And so this is where, where we need um, tools. We need to, so Clinton, um, when, we, when we're talking about this strong need for us to get past fear, I think Fear on, in any realm of life stops us from doing everything that we, we would like to do. Uh, and this fear is just that much more destructive, I think, to everybody's ability to move forward with harmony, as you just stated, Walter. Um, so, Clennon, what are your thoughts on this and maybe some thoughts on how we can move past this fear or, you know, get past this stuff, just very much like white fragility, so we can move forward into doing the real work that needs to be done. Like yeah, I, I very much echo what Walter said. Um, I think there's a lot more logic to this whole basis of fear. In many respects, I think it's legitimate. When you basically have built a nation that basically says that, you know, you're the winner, um, you know, and suddenly things shift, that's a wake up call. Uh, it's going to be fear. Um, but that's, that's how this, this country was built. Um, yeah, I don't think that it's going to be uh, necessarily um, sort of a kumbaya moment in terms of facilitating change. You know, and maybe I talked about this a little bit earlier, but there was a guy who was, I believe he was out of Maryland, um, and he, he settled. I know at least he had a house in New Bedford. Uh, by the name of Frederick Douglass. And he always said, look, power concedes nothing without a demand. Never has, 
and never will. And yeah, you're going to be uncomfortable. Uh, and I think in many respects, um, you know, when you've built a nation that basically is on the backs of other people, you know, how do you suddenly give up that? And then, of course, the thing that I think is really uh, the bedrock, a lot of the fear is the nasty R word. And we're talking about the bottom line. And we're talking about reparations. We're talking about repairing a relationship because the relationship between blacks and whites in this country, and again, this is not according to Clennon, this is according to history, has been an abusive relationship. And so if you look at a you know, battered wife syndrome, there's certain things. What does the, the uh, abuse do? Do they stay? Do they, do they hang out? Do they survive? How do they manage? And we want to you know, go along to get along, but this is dangerous stuff. And so um, it's not easily, easily navigated. I mean, there's going to be, there's, this is a really sort of come to Jesus conversation. I don't think it's going to be easy to necessarily do this. You're talking about serving up omelets. And when you talk about serving up omelets, you're talking about breaking eggs. And, and that's essentially, you know, kind of how I see it at this point. Sorry, I don't have, you know, something nice to serve up, but. I think that that was a fa fantastic analogy, though, because uh, that's with with any kind of abusive relationship, there is a huge amount of uh, horrifying things that the abuser has to look at, and they may not be ready to look at that. And that's the thing is we need to do that uncomfortable work of looking at what happened, acknowledging it and figuring out how you move forward, but it's a partnership to do that. And so there is gonna be a lot of bravery needed, Tiffany, again, um, to use that word, there's gonna be a lot of bravery that on both sides that is gonna be needed. So thank you for, for all of that. I think that uh, this, this, this subject, this, um, this fear that we're talking about is, is something that we all have. Um, so I guess, what would you say if you were to say one thing that could help us take a step forward uh, toward acknowledging our own fear and acknowledging our own discomfort and moving on um, as far as advice, Peter? It might be a difficult question, but just something that you have experienced is something that's helped you. Sure, and, and it goes back to taking a look at who you're, um, who you're spending time with and the kind of conversations that you're having. So when we talk about doing uh, behavioral inclusion training with uh, various groups. We talk about, number one, taking a look in the mirror and saying, who is it that I'm spending my time with at work and who am I spending my time with while I'm at home? And if there's a big difference there, you have to ask yourself, why is that? And determine whether or not you want to move forward. Again, I hate to oversimplify it by saying it's going to take curiosity and courage, but that's really, in my mind, what it boils down to. It's, and it's also about when you see something or hear something that you think is inappropriate, you should be asking questions about why that's happening. So quite often, um, we, we're avoiding that confrontation. I think, um, Michael, you might have said that we, sometimes we try avoid things that are uncomfortable because it's a heck of a lot easier than you know, potentially addressing with a friend that the comment that they just made is uh, offensive and would be offensive to the other person that's part of the conversation. But the only way we're going to make progress is by having that intestinal fortitude in order to uh, move things forward. Thank you. Sandy? Yeah, I mean, I've thought a lot about this. And um, I think that change happens um, when people connect and when they connect in meaningful ways. And I think Peter really uh, alluded to that. And I can remember um, a workshop that I did um, probably 20 years ago with a group of elderly people, uh, half of whom were from uh, Eastern Europe, Jewish mostly, and, and a bunch of young people who were uh, many races from different countries, uh, African-Americans from here. And they all started the, the group in a very uh, fearful place. 
The elders were afraid of the young people. The young people felt marginalized. And in the course of a day of getting to know each other and connecting in a really powerful, meaningful way, by the end, they were wanting to have a dance together. They were arm in arm. They had their arms around each other. And it was really, uh, of all the workshops, and I did many, many over years, it really resonated with me because it was like magic to see the power of these connections. And I really think if we're going to make a change, uh, change comes in a variety of ways. But the most powerful in my lifetime has been when people connect to one another. And I actually did this out of a prosecutor's office where I worked for 17 years for a prosecutor. So it was, uh, it was a fantastic thing and there were many of them, but this one stood out to me. Those powerful connections where people heard each other's stories. The young people heard about how these elderly people had experienced a lot of the same things when they were young. It was magic. It was magic. So Aww. anyway, that's what comes to mind. Um, Aww, thank you, Sandy. Michael? Well, I was just thinking back to, to to, I, to, so two comments. Number one, you know, my my concern uh, is that fear doesn't turn to anger to then morph into action, and it's never. And if that process occurs, it's never in a productive way. You know, so the fear that that turns into anger isn't fear, isn't white fear of uh, that we live in an unequal society, and we then. Um, you get angry about the unequal society and we're going to do something about it. It's, it's more, much more commonly, overwhelmingly, maybe, maybe even almost exclusively that the fear turns to anger, resentment, anger, and turns to action. Um, and that people start hurting other people because of what they are and not. Uh, and, and so uh, I think one way to do that is of course, to depersonalize it. Now, I, I can't speak to the other side of the, prop, uh, of the racial proposition that it's hard not to personalize when uh, you're a black person and the systemic, the structural uh, issues that we've talked about and that exist are, are there. It's, it's tough to not personalize it to you. So I'm not speaking on, on that from that perspective. I'm speaking it from a white person um, is it, it can help us think about these issues uh, by by uh, not over personalizing them, uh, you know, when we talk about white privilege, it, it, you know, we we're talking first and foremost about a structure and a system and a his and a history. Um, you have to take ownership of it because you know we're all citizens and members of this community. But when when someone when we talk about the subject, it, it shouldn't be. It's it's not someone glaring at you individually. Now, maybe sometimes it is, but I, I, you know, let's just say in this group, it's not. <laughs> um, and uh, and I, I think it can help um, talk about difficult issues w when, when you can talk through them and someone doesn't um, think in their, in their head, their first reaction isn't, oh, they must be talking about me uh, in terms of the deep end um, overt racist or I think I'm better than you. Now it may be that uh, that the that we've been raised uh, to be the first in line, uh, the way that you've been talking it, and and there's some and there's more inherent um, unconscious uh, issues that need to be addressed. But I'm talking about how you have the even the first and second tier conversations. It could help. It, it helps me by saying, well, I don't, the person's not calling me a racist um, uh, first and foremost, so. That brings up a lot of things because I'm, I'm also looking at the comments um, and, and, you know, there's so many ways you can approach these, this conversation and the fact that, you know, we have to have this conversation. Um, I'm reading a comment from Ken who says, you know, I've been listening to these broadcasts and um, that his initial feeling is that people are standoffish because of the dialogue I'm, I'm assuming, Ken, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but that you're saying it's it's not presented as a natural conversation. That it's it, it there's we're approaching this 
with gender and race and things like that out front. So it immediately puts us in this situation where we are drawing attention to our differences, maybe rather than our um, what unifies us. Um, and so that is that's a good point, and that's somewhere where we hope to get. I think, uh, but just drawing from past uh, past conversations we've had, and the fact that you know we these race panels, these discussions that we're having right now are for the people who want to make the change, that those people that we're talking about that are gonna get highly offended and aggressive and defensive when we have a conversation with them about race and race equity because of their own inner anger and resentment and fear, um, those are conversations that will have to happen at some point, but right now maybe strengthening this, this enormous middle ground uh, is the way to go. Clinton, I want to ask you about that kind of, of thing, you know, because it, it is a kind of a difficult, uh, it's difficult when you get out there and you want to have these conversations, you want to erase racism, but you can't erase racism without addressing it and talking about racism. You know, you have to first, like, what are our steps? We just have to go down that road first and, and say, okay, um, I'm well, going to hold well, my- I don't know. I mean, I think Laurel, that we are um, doing what we hope is going to be sort of a delicate and easy way out. And, you know, you're talking to a historian, you're talking to a documentary filmmaker, you're talking to a journalist. And so I go to those sources in large part for guidance. And I think about the good things that have come out of this country, um, that it was pushback from people who were discriminated against for their religion in the very state you're in, that ultimately prompted them to, to take up arms, not to sing Kumbaya and hold hands with the British, but to take up arms and to take them to task and to build the nation. Granted, there was a lot of bad things that happened, but that's something that we tend to be proud of, that basically we, we gained our independence, that there were arms taken up as well as we're concerned the ending of slavery and vis-a-vis -vis the Civil War that this was a good thing. But again, violence was, 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 a pre I mean, was the, the subtext uh, and certainly the vehicle by which people got each other's attention. Uh, the same thing with the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act. Again, we think about um, you know, the dogs and water hoses and the four little girls in Birmingham. And we think about the acid in the swimming pool in St. Augustine. Um, and you know, that's that. And then we think about Bloody Sunday and John Lewis, all of these things were underscored. People got it and, legis and structural changes were made. Legislation was brought about, but violence was always there. And it would be great if we could just somehow persuade that egg to come out, that yolk, that white to come out of that shell without, but so oftentimes it just seems like in this country, that's what, what people understand. And so, you know, my father was always of the opinion for that reason, and it was one of the reasons I'll tell you, and I'll, I'll, I'll throw it back over to you. It was one of the reasons that my hometown of Albany, Georgia, was thought of where concerns the civil rights movement was thought of as a failure. And part of the reason it was thought of as a failure is that it was thought of as not being very violent. In other words, nonviolence and nonviolence, you don't have any electricity. You need nonviolence and you need violence in order to facilitate change. And so, you know, I, I just look at these structural changes we keep wishing would happen, people would see the light. But history is a testament that people only understand, <laughs> you know, at the end of the barrel of a gun, unfortunately. But the, these, are, these are major things we celebrate. The beginning of this country, you know, the, uh, the ending of slavery, um, the, the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act, all these major things. And what was there? That's what people understood in the end. It's unfortunate, but it is what it is. And so I'll leave that for what yeah, it's no. worth. So I, I no, I, I I hear what you're saying. It's it's one of those things where you know a lot of people don't hear, and the people that maybe are the hard, most hard headed or unable to break through their own stubbornness is that's uh, they only hear things when they are brought with great force. And these well, hold on. Uh, let me let me just say, Laurel, as well. E yeah. Even where we are now, I don't think it's by accident that we're having these discussions. This is on the end of a year where the Black Lives Matter movement happened, there was a lot of violence that was involved. You had Ahmaud Aubrey, you had uh, Rashad Brooks in Atlanta, you had, of course, the guy out in Minneapolis, 
Um, you had the woman, Breonna Taylor, all of this violence and all of this. That's what gets people's attention ultimately. And then structural changes are made. It's, it's, it's not by accident we're here. We're here for that reason. It's what it is. So I'll say that to you. And so there we go. I mean, it's uncomfortable to admit that, but it's a reality that we have to come to terms with. It's a reality that we need to uh, stop trying to hide from. Uh, the only way we're going to move forward is if we are having these conversations that, of course, are going to need to be uncomfortable because they're gonna, there's a lot of things that are very deep. And when they're revealed to the light, you have to adjust your eyes, you know, and it's going to be uncomfortable. And, and I think that there's a lot we're doing here with maybe empowering all of us to just uh, stop apologizing and start acting on um, with some very real traction and taking everything that all of you panelists are, are saying to us, which is don't hide from what we feel and don't and hold ourselves accountable now as, as individuals, but also hold the people that we are with accountable. And, and you know, when they're telling jokes or when they're doing these other things of what we're, what's acceptable and what's not. Uh, Dr. Collier, with, you know, building off of what we've just talked about, uh, you know, this, we've got to stop, we've got to break up the concrete around our fear and move forward with, uh, with different mindsets. And so how, can we, in this day and age, when there is still so much violence, how can we use that to make, how can we carry that forward and, and, and plant um, seeds of change, for lack of a better way of putting it? Um, how can we use these tragedies, which we are, we're up in arms about it, but there's so many of us that want to learn how we can be part of being a good advocate, accomplice and partner in crime, you know, a, a co-conspirator. Well, I'm sure we could come up with uh, a number of different ways, but two things come to mind. Uh, we have to be persistent. That's our brand of violence that we have to use. We can't let up. We have to continue to put pressure on decision makers, put pressure on people to change their ways of thinking about this, this massive problem. But persistence, persistence, persistence. Uh, and this gets back to, not back, but it gets to one of the questions that I think you're going to pose later, uh, this thing about Black History Month. It has to be all the time, 24-7, 365 plus. There should be no stop to it. Because once there's a stop, the attention of most people in the public will dissipate and they'll be off to something else. Uh, by the time April rolls around, not many people are going to be that interested in Black History Month. But thank God for people like Tiffany, who is, is determined to keep the conversation going. The only way you're going to get change is you can't give up. It's one of the things that I address the uh, Black Lives Matter movement at, at uh, uh, Beagle Bun uh, last year is that if you're out here because you need something to discuss at your next cocktail party, or you wanna go back to your home to tell people what you did for the summer, you need, you need to leave. You don't need to be here because we're dealing with a formidable problem and it's gonna take a lot of persistence. There's gonna be a lot of frustration. There's gonna be some violence. There's gonna be some pushback. There's gonna be all kinds of things that are happening. I mean, it's, it's just the nature of what we're dealing with. I mean, it's like a woman giving birth. There's no way in the world she's going to give birth without any pain. It's going to come. It's going to be part of the process. And we're trying to birth a new nation, so to speak, or a new way to think. The other thing is that white people need to be educated, and I don't mean to be presumptuous, about the dangerous effects of their anger the dangerous effects of their anger. Their anger, for example, has rendered them vulnerable to people who lie, who say, oh, your problems are the result of black people or, or Spanish people or Mexican people. It's the result of this and that. And in anger, there is desperation and desperation often brings a lot of blindness and ignorance. And people run after things thinking, this is the answer that I need. This is what I need to hear. No, you just make yourself more manipulable by people who do not have your interests at heart. 
The other thing that we all should know or remember from basic psychology is that anger does more damage to the person who's angry than the person who the anger is targeted to. And we see that trend beginning to emerge in medical research. The, 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 uh, the rate of suicides among whites is skyrocketing. The, 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 uh, the drug abuse is skyrocketing. Depression is skyrocketing because the, the ground has been shaken under them and, and things are just not manageable anymore. And, 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 it's, and it's not just black people who are gonna be hurt by this anger, white people are gonna end up and they have already hurt themselves in the process. And that needs to be brought to awareness that nobody is so disconnected that they can be angry and not be affected by the anger itself. And so I guess what I'm saying in essence, more education, uh, 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 trying to bring about a greater awareness uh, because, you know, this, this beast that we call anger, if we don't get control of it, it's going to destroy all of us, ultimately. And it'll start on the individual level. Yeah. You know, I mean, going, like you said, it, it goes back to education and, and really a lot of the comments from last week and this week, it, it's about how... It's conversations and education. Um, the, the people relearning, just kind of, uh, again, doing that controlled burn, getting rid of all the dead wood that we have in our, our, our experiences. And, and depending on the generation we come from, the uh, well, still the history books that have so much history not in them. And maybe um, as so many people last week, and I wanna make sure that I, um, if I'm not giving credit where credit's due, but there were some comments made last week about needing more black teachers in schools and, and in nursery schools and preschools and getting to these kids younger and younger and younger so that we can um, fill their hearts up with, with a history that is balanced and, and their minds up so that they grow up with the right information. And then there's less damage control now that we have to do with all of what's been set in place. And there's, there's a fresh new generation that can help continue to move that forward. Um, you know, talking about Black History Month, um, it, I think it's, it's, it's something that has come up so often in conversations that I've had with people. And there's this great quote from Morgan Freeman on the Martha's Vineyard Regional High School uh, advertising, you know, their, their, th their sign out front about, I don't believe in Black History Month. Every day is Black History Day. And, and so there was a woman I got, and I got an email that I just want to reference because it, it brings to, to kind of close out the last 15 minutes here. It, it's frustrating because hours not long enough to get everybody um, to say what we need to say, but uh, hopefully some seeds are being planted that we need to be accountable for ourselves and we need to be brave and we need to just be okay being uncomfortable. Feel the fear, do it anyway. Feel the discomfort and know that it's okay because this is what it's going to take. Um, like, just like exercising new muscles, you know, you're going to ache for a little while and then you're going to get okay. So what she talks about is, um, this is her, she says, last night I watched a couple of episodes of the former public television series, Soul. Never mind that it was innovative in featuring both live music segments and serious topical discussions and interviews. One of the episodes featured Mrs. Georgia Jackson, mother of slain Soledad brother, George Jackson. What struck me most were two things. First, her words about what was happening 50 years ago is still happening today. And two, how is it possible that we live in a country where a black man was elected president twice, yet we've made so little progress on race issues? Second thing she brought up was in just in a simple search and Wikipedia, which, you know, it's a, she wanted to make sure that we knew it was Wikipedia because sometimes Wikipedia has other information, but she said that, you know, it, it, it talks about in, uh, Black History Month starting in 1970, even though Negro History Week had been established in 1926 by Carter Woods. So do the panelists. Do you think, and I know Tiffany, you have something to say on this. I'm going to start with you, Tiffany. Uh, do the panelists think that Black History Month accomplishes its goal or do they agree with that goal? Do they think the event is worthwhile? I do have something to say. So I appreciate you starting with me. I do not think Black History Month is long enough. I agree with the comment of I'm Black 24-7, 365 days out of the year all the time. And I think that we learn, Black people have to learn about white history all the time. 
white people need to be learning about our history. And I think that for me and the circles that I run in, all of us are doing this new thing this year where we're doing a black history year. So we're not taking just a month, we're taking the whole year because we believe that it's important and my black excellence matters. And so that's like a quick um, answer to that. And I also want to just say, Carter G. Woodson was the person who, um, was the name you were saying, Laurel? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Woodson. Yes. Did I get that wrong? Yeah. Carter. Carter yeah. Carter Woodson. Woodson. Okay. Woodson. Carter G. Woodson. And it's okay because we're all learning. Like none of us are perfect in this. However, we all need to be intentional about continuing this education. Thank you. Thank you, Tiffany. Yes, exactly. And I love your spirit. And I love the fact that you're saying that because I think a lot of people feel that, you know, that's what it should be. And uh, using maybe Black History Month as a springboard into realizing that every day should be, it, it's all, always should be the right time to be talking about this. Um, who would like to go next, Clennon? No, I mean, I, with all due respect, and I love Tiffany to death. <laughs> I'm sorry, I love Black History Month. Um, I don't want Christmas all year long. I don't want that. I basically, I want my Black History Month. I think that, uh, you know, Dr. King had a saying, something to the effect, you know, you measure a society by how well it treats the least of these. And so to me, Black History Month is an opportunity to, to do the very thing we've been talking about all along, and that is to educate. I want an opportunity to educate, number one, myself, but also others around me that we are, it's a cold, these are cold months, basically. Uh, the month of February is cold. If people are cooped up, there's a reason for them to read and focus and all of that. Frankly, I love the, yeah, granted, it's 28 days and we, we may feel a little bit short shrift there, but I love Black History Month. Um, you know, a lot of my business comes out of Black History Month. So, um, no, I've, I've got no complaints about Black History Month. That's fine. I mean, granted, yeah, the rest of the year you can go ahead and do, if it's a good story, it's a good story. Um, mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, Black History Month. And, and one more thing, I do want to say this real quickly. Where it concerns Black history, though, and I always tell my audience is this, I don't think it's the responsibility of white people to tell me my history. I think it's the responsibility of Black people to know their history uh, and to be about the business of that. That's their job. We were the ones at the feet of our grandmother. It wasn't like uh, the Chinese were at the feet of a Jewish grandmother or a Jew was at the feet of a Chinese grandmother. You know, these people were where they were. And so each community has to go ahead and be responsible for their history. So, you know, I can't stand when I hear, well, the school never taught me that. Well, it's not the school's job. It's our job. This is our community. So I'll say that I'm a great fan of Black History Month. That's great. I mean, I like the disparity because there's, you know, there's, there, I like the, you know, everybody has something different and everybody looks at things through different lenses too. I will bring in the whole thing. Um, I was just reading a comment again from Ken, who is, uh, he is a teacher in an alternative situation. I'm thinking charter school or something like that, where there's, he's seen no initiatives. Um, just as a comment um, to the educational part, he has seen no initiatives put in place to bring more uh, diversity into the teaching staff. So that might be something that, you know, people can start to, uh, on a legislative level, start to go towards that. Tiffany? I have something to add. Um, something I thought about, Clinton, while you were talking is I'm also wondering, like, even how the North and the South, like, how this affects the North and the South. Because, and I say that because of this, I was on an, I lived, I was raised in Washington, D.C., which is the North and the South. Um, it's like past the Mason Dixon line. And down south, like we love Black History Month. It was always celebrated. It was a huge deal. But then I came to school in Quincy. Um, and I'm just going to say it really nicely and just say that it, I did not get the same feels for Black History Month in the North compared to when I lived in the South. And so I wonder if also we need to acknowledge um, we need to acknowledge the North and the South in this conversation too. Well, I, I, I will say this, Tiffany, for what it's worth. Um, and I understand, yeah, there are differences without questions, but you know, the black community is full of black churches and six days a week, those churches are, 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 are vacant. And there's no reason why those black ministers and them black deacons and deaconesses can't fill those schools and those basements up in terms of doing, you know, uh, schooling, uh, cultural schooling about our history. And, you know, it doesn't have to be, you know, 
incredible research. I mean, there are stories all around us in every community in this country, irrespective of whether it's below the Mason-Dixon line or above it. And the history is just as rich in New England as it is down south. And, you know, but I hear the same thing all over the place. Uh, but I, I hear what you're saying. But I do think at the end of the day, we've got to take control of our own story, our own history, our, our you know, our own narrative in, in, in many respects, and not rely upon another community to do that. So I, I, the, first, the first, for me, the buck stops where we give our money every Sunday, and that is at the church. We need to start using that building to do that. That's my own take, my two cents. I'll hush up. No, and, and you know, I think that in addition to that, just from a white uh, person's perspective too, I think that um, white children should be able to learn that history so that they grow up with the, with the knowledge um, also. Oh, hold on, wait, 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 Laurel, Laurel, let me say this to you. Yeah. Uh, there's a huge fan of black history that I love on your island. And you know him, his name is Tom Dresser. He's been a white boy all of his life, not just two weeks, all of his life. That guy knows black history on that island in a huge way. I'm a huge fan of his. So I just want you to know on that island, that guy is a go-to guy. His work, his books are on, on, on point. So I, I, I'm a huge fan. Sometimes, you know, you're wearing ruby slippers and you don't realize it. You don't have to go to the land of Oz to get to where you need to go. Dressers on that island, talk to her. And we also have the Martha, Martha's Vineyard African-American Heritage Trail with Elaine Weintraub, who's also another great source um, on this island for, for African-American history. So we do have um, some amazing people who are white who know the African-American history. And so, I mean, we, we know everybody needs to be educated as a child um, and as an adult too, with on both sides of the, um, of the, the coin here with, when it comes to this. Thank you, Clennon. Um, Peter, just, we have a couple of minutes left. I want to get um, Sandy and Peter and Michael and, and Walter to talk about Black History Month. Well, from my perspective, Laurel, I, I, I'm, you know, I'm not a, a, a lifelong student. I wish I could say I was. I've been too busy raising a family and trying to make a living. And I, I love to be reminded every February that there's things that I still don't know as a diversity and inclusion practitioner about Black history. I was happened to have a, a National Geographic on today and I was watching a special on Abraham Lincoln. And I learned stuff this afternoon that I didn't really realize about the, the, our country and how we are where we are today. And then made the connections to what we just went through on January 6th and on election day this year and what those connection points are. So I think we have to become better students overall. I saw one of the comments in the chat panel about we need to get better as a, as a society about understanding how we got where we are so we can understand a better pathway forward. And Black History Month's a great reminder to focus some effort in this particular area. Sandy? Yes, thank you. I think Black Lives, uh, I mean, Black History Month is, is uh, like, a way for us to to sort of honor people, but I think that we also um, need, as white people, to be aware that even during this month, our socialization and this may be the difficult talk we, that we're talking about has been um, uh, focused on the negative socialization we during during the, the trial this week, the, the continued stereotyping, the continued focus on, on Black Lives Matter violence. And, and meanwhile, as Glennon pointed out, this part of history is all these young people and people of color who have been murdered. And we continue to get socialized as white people, even during Black History Month. So that's just something that to be noted, I think, to be aware always of how we're being socialized and how people are, are capitalizing on our ignorance in some ways, you know, so. Dr. Collier, thank you, Sandy. Uh, uh, well, let me just repeat what I said earlier. Uh, Black History Month is not enough. It's not enough, but it's not enough particularly for Black people, uh, because we tend to use it to celebrate ourselves 
to reconnect with one another, to reconnect to the motherland, uh, to remember people who have who have passed on and who have done wonderful things, great things, sacrificial things for us. But I think Black History Month also has uh, uh, a liability in that it's separated and is marginalized. Uh, Black history, as as uh, Skip Gates and many others often say, is really American history. And if we extract it from the greater American history, then we're missing out on the context. And we're also undereducating people who are not Black, because they need to see that what Black people are talking about is what America is about. Like we often hear people nowadays when they hear something negative about America or their racist attitudes and somebody will say, well, that's not America. Well, of course it is. Of course it is. So I think, you know, is while black history needs to be taught uh, and I agree with Clemens, you know, by black people uh, for the sake of building us up and keeping us remembering who we are and how we got here for the general broader population in America, it needs to be integrated into American history. It needs to be woven in so much that it can't be extricated very easily because how America got here has a lot to do with uh, the lives and the contributions and the deaths and the births and everything else concerning black people. And I, I don't think we, we need to I, I'm not saying we should get rid of the Black History Month or Black History Year, but I think there should also be an effort to integrate Black history in American history. And that gets to the very difficult problem of trying to get the powers that be in Texas to do something about the textbooks that they approve and produce because they're biased. They're biased from the first chapter to the very end of the books that our students read. And I think if we're gonna change mindsets across races, then we have to educate across races. And one of the incentives to doing so is to say, well, I'm gonna deal with history that involves the, the, the uh, Africans, the Irish, the Italians, the Greeks, the Jews, and you get attention from a broader uh, 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 sector of the population rather than simply focusing on one thing. And the other liability that, that Black History Month brings with it is that it, it gives the white racists an excuse. All right, I gave them something. They got their 28 days. So let me go back to lynching them and raping them and robbing them and murdering them, et cetera, et cetera. And we don't want to feed into that kind of thing. So I, I don't think Black History Month per se is, is the all in all solution to what we're trying to, to get at. There are many other facets that are connected to it that need to be addressed. And in addition to the, what the woman that you're referencing said that we need more black teachers, we do. So the black students can see models, they can see people that look like them. But once again, the textbooks need to be changed. They need to be changed. Otherwise, the students are going to learn the same old stuff, the same old stuff about Europe, about Europe, about Europe, and about Europe, and nothing will change. I'm so done. thank you. No, thank you. Don't ever be done, but thank you. I want to just, before we get to Michael, I want to say it is 602. I hope you'll bear with us for a little while longer. Not bear with us, but I hope you'll just keep, stay with us for just another five minutes or so, because um, I, I don't want to just and because it's six o'clock, I really think this is an important thing. We need to wrap up here. And Michael, I'd love to get your thoughts on Black History Month too. Well, I'll, I'll end uh, my participation or comments where I started. I don't think if Black History Month is an exclusive proposition that eliminates the other 11 months, then it's not a good thing. But I, I don't read it as having that as the purpose or mission if it's to elevate or to put focus on a, a particular part of American history that has been undersold and under um, appreciated and under taught, then, then it serves a very useful purpose. And I, and I, I think it's more the latter than the former. Maybe, uh, maybe we all and educators in particular need to better 
explain that proposition that uh, that it again it's not a zero sum proposition that if you uh, focus on something for a month you get the pass for the 11 months uh, and and I and I don't and I and I hope it's a, a refrain uh, that um, that black history is part of American history it's part of the binder and if that uh, and that's a good thing. I actually think that's a, a pos- even even with the the harm and the injury um, and the seriousness of uh, of some uh, of uh, of some of what we've been talking about enslaved people for centuries uh, that come to um, that we have had to to uh, confront and and work and we're still working our way through. Um, if we view it all as our collective history, um, then then I think um, we're better for it. Well said, Michael. You know, that's with these panels every week, we um, uncover just a little bit more. Uh, we pull the, the bandage off a little bit more. And hopefully uh, we are able to grow from these experiences and add to our own thought process and our own ability to go out into the world and change the way we interact and the way we, the words we use and the way we think about things being a little more uh, mindful and, and stopping before we respond to things and seeing where we can make an impact. Because uh, it, you know, there's so many different things we've talked about, about ways we can make an impact as an individual. And there are a lot of ways too, which again, you can go to mvyradio.org slash diversity. And we have a reference library with ref with links from our panelists, as well as people who have, have um, added them to the chat and things we've discovered about how you can, what laws, I mean, we've gotten questions about what laws can we change? Can, what, what should I not support? What should I go against? And so today I think that what we came up with was Black History Month is in and of itself uh, uniquely important in many ways, but it is, it should just be kind of a, a, a diving board into the rest of the year where we um, continue to integrate African American history into what is American history. And we all can play a part in that, um, no matter what we do for a living, um, just by adding in those stories. And as Clinton said, if it's a good story, it's a good story. And good stories come from human beings, and every one of us has a good story. And we need to tell them, we need to witness them. We need to encourage each other to uh, feel confident in our own voices and be brave and move forward. And I wanna thank everybody who has participated in these panels. And we have one more week and I hope you'll be here next week because next week is gonna be a crescendo and be a discussion for future uh, versions of this uh, so that we can continue this conversation because as again, uh, four conversations, four one hour long conversations is not going to be enough for any of us. Uh, there is a camaraderie you build through communication like this. There is a, a comfort you build within yourself that you can settle into a little bit more and how to speak about things. So uh, I think this is just, I hope it has been as beneficial and as um, mind expanding for you as it has been for me. I am so grateful to all the panelists for your wisdom and for your patience and for your time commitment and for the, the things that you've shared with us, the things, the corrections you've made for us. And, and I, on behalf of everybody, I invite us all to be comfortable being uncomfortable. You know, just who cares? We are all people and we're all trying to create this harmony. Let's just be able to be ourselves and not be defensive as much as we can. And it's gonna take time, steps, you know, massaging those muscles, but we can all do this. And I, I think that, you know, thank you very much for all of your, your love and attention to, um, to these topics and sending in your questions. If you have questions, please, yes, Walter. I was just saying thank you. Oh, Walter, thank you. If you have questions for any of the panelists um, that we didn't get to tonight, please email me. Uh, you can get my email address at mbyradio.org. Once again, I want to thank Ahanu Bedford, who is, uh, thank, uh, we're so grateful to you for uh, underwriting these panels. And uh, Jess Faneff, who's been uh, behind the scenes, but so important. And Michaela Pichet, thank you for uh, the entire team at the radio station. And um, we appreciate being, a being able to have these and help us all move forward with these very difficult but important conversations. So I hope you'll stick around right now because we, as we do every week, we wanna end on a positive, joyful note and uh, bring our black joy moment into your life to send you into your evening. And I hope you have a cozy night and thank you so much for being here. I'm Laurel Reddington, have a wonderful night.
My black joy is being fearless. And you know, I don't have to be worried about what the world may think of me, what the world may look at me like, because at the end of the day, I'm accepted. My black joy is being able to be authentically myself. My black joy is multidimensional. My black joy is powerful and magical. So for me, Black Lives Matter, it, it, it just showcased just really the reality of, of America, I think. I will stay and shine a light on the Black plight. Um, the Black Lives Matter movement placed a magnifying glass, of course, um, on, the, on the things that need improvement in the country. Some positive ways that the Black Lives Matter movement has impacted me is, one, knowing that my generation, people who are my age, are capable of coming together and organizing for the progression of Black people in this country. And I'm just proud to know that I was created the way I was created um, on purpose. My favorite part about being Black is our inclusivity. We make any and everything cool, our skin and the confidence of a Black woman. My favorite part of Black culture, honestly, I just love how magical we are. Our melanin is truly a superpower. Thank you, everyone.